the sides. I had to go hunt up where to start, stop recording is. And I don't know, there were like three other things happened this morning. This is Coffee Compiler Club. I'm whining about people changing things for no good reason, causing all my workflows to break. Um, and maybe we'll get around to talking about compilers and language runtimes and things like that. Uh, I don't know. I had people complain about my internet speed, the chat bots telling me that my whatever's weren't working because my internet's obviously not working, but here I am recording with, you know, nine or 10 people on, so it doesn't matter. And other things happen that are unrelated to, to Compiler Club, but are sort of semi-entertaining if you don't live in the mountains. Um, done. We we're on, uh, we recorded live and be on YouTube in a couple hours. Yes, an online chatbot told me my internet was out. Yes, exactly. That was the online chatbot trying to tell me that my internet was out. <laughs> I am unclear well, I mean, I, how that works, so, but fine. I got an SMS from uh, like, you know, that my internet might be also broken between like, yeah, you know, right. I guess. So yeah, if, if I drop out instantly, that's, that's what it is. Like, yeah. All right. And then what? Yes, uh, uh, Elon Musk's Cybertruck was driving down the only road to my house. So that was worth, you know, a worth a look at. I'm telling you, there's stuff going on this morning that just made no sense. <laughs> Fine. Uh, uh, Onat, did you want to demo something? Yeah, I mean, I could demo the language that I've been working on for a very long while. Like it's mature enough. Like the ideas are mature enough, and well, like, well, um, yeah, I feel like it could be like a good time to demo with for for especially with you folks who could like you know. Well, you're gonna go give, live on on YouTube, like so do it. Yes, right. So um, I could actually yeah share the screen. Okay, so that's your sync, right? Yeah. Right. So, um, so yeah, this is like a quite. By the way, can you see the camera at the same time, is, or is that like? It is. Anyway. It is completely black. I think I, I cannot see you, but you also are just <laughs> incredibly in a dark space. I was just coding like a um, light strip thing where, like, um, I I would try to open up like a um, like light from my TV. Okay, so that should kind of work better, right? <laughs> you became a, you became a, a, yes, we can see you now. Hello. So, yes, so, right. Can you say, just for the record, can you say, my precious? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is like probably my goblin mode. Sorry, guys. Like, I've been like working for four weeks straight on like um on a product and then i decide to rewrite the language and then product inside the language again so um the language is still ongoing but like yeah so i can i can just demo the language um now that the lights are open but my oled is totally gonna burn if i can close this down how is the name what is the name of your language oh it's called uh kyra like, um, yes. Well, it's 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 a code name for now. I had several names for it, but it's most probably going to be called Kyra. Um, it's a um, Fort-like language that's like, um, well, that's not like really other forts. Well, okay, this is like a very impromptu talk, so like um, that I've been thinking about <laughs> preparing for a like giving for a long time. So yeah. Anyway, here it goes. So um, the thing. So, for like um, the thing with forts is, I think like most forts are like runtime uh, oriented. Well, they they uh, execute at the runtime, whereas uh, this language is strictly like compile time. Like I don't execute any of this at all in runtime. I just generate stuff with it and then execute that. So I can uh, ex start executing some uh, stuff. Okay, let's let's just like demo some stuff here. Okay, yeah, we're loading this. So um, the syntax of the language is quite simple. So uh, this would be like a definition. Um, I can print stuff like say like hello log and it says like hello right here. Um, I can like um, say hello 
sometimes, like say, um, oops, sorry, wrong syntax. I can say hello 64 times or 64 I times where I have this also element called I, which I think I was printing like this or whatever. <laughs> it's it's there, like you know, I can I can print it like this. Um, and like um, yeah, anyway. So let's say it it's the execution is like it, it's it's still like this iteration is still text based. I mean, the next iteration is going to be like binary. It, it is binary based, actually. It's almost complete, but like that's maybe next week. <laughs> like this is the previous iteration that's like still text based instead of like binary based. And um, so, so yeah. Anyway. So so it, most fourths are not strongly typed, or they're dynamically typed at best. Is that what you got here? Uh well, I got like a okay. I can open the other um, thing where like um, my font. So I got another iteration here. It's like compiling oh, shaders. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that was like the 4K output version. I have to switch back to like, I have to go back a little, like 1080p. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, the font's right. a little hard to read too, but it's also popping furiously about as you're screwing with things. <laughs> yeah, this is like the 4K edition. I can like. It seems um... like you're taking a photo of your monitor as opposed to screen sharing. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh... It's warped like an old TV would be. Yeah. Oh, yes, 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 exactly. That's like totally intentional. So this font is also defined in this language. So I got it defined here. So. Actually, I can close down the windows. It's defined as old TV font. Would you like to play a game, Professor? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's totally where it's going. Like, uh, you're going to game in your ID or, like, yeah, I mean, you, OK. Can you kill your background? Makes it hard to read? How about a game of tic-tac-toe? Uh, it... <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is what you mean, right? Like. No, I mean you have this morphing uh, amorphous blue shaping blob in the middle, and dots everywhere. There, it's gone now, and that was oh, making it okay. hard to read. You also flip screens furiously, which you can't look at any one screen for more than half a second. So none of it's readable per se. Yes, you yes. trying to describe uh, a language. You need to you need to slow down and sort of start from the start. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, I mean, this is like a demo for like font example. So if I can change the font dynamically and if I press enter again, so that A became an N and I can like go back again and that's that's an A. Like, so this right. many languages like, you know, start from bottom left to, to like, and then like stroke the top left. Yeah, and you're the describing top right. a font using turtle graphics. Exactly. <laughs> gotcha. I mean, and this is the very font you're using at the moment. Exactly. Exactly. And it's all live. Like we can change the B here, and like if we like, I haven't that, done shit like this since I was, you know, eighteen or something. <laughs> it's like a long time ago. I did font things, not total graphics font. I just did pixel blasting with zero hex numbers. Fine. Yeah. Yeah, this is generating like um, spirally from all of this stuff. It's not like it's, it's okay now. Okay, so so, here, but... so so you're showing a screen full of font displays written obviously in a fourth like language. On the yes. right, there's some uh, x86 machine code scrolling down, and you want to describe where yes. that's coming from? Uh, that should be coming from. I mean, let's see. That's the output. Uh, so yeah, it's coming from these stuff. So if I, yeah, it was all this stuff. What was that? The land transition control. So I was transitioning this language from this form, which is the old text form. So I still have like definition begin and end here versus like this new textual form, which is um, it's opening now. Yeah, I so, know the blue blob every few seconds. Yeah, there's some there's some things going on here that uh, need, need some work on presentation. Raw, raw <laughs> is not what I would describe this. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like primordial was oh. more like it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Antalya's here. Sorry, somebody's waiting at the break room. I'm staring at your screen. We're getting an entertaining 
entertaining view through life of uh, you archaic. Okay. So, yeah. So yeah, the, the language syntaxes, these are like definitions. So right. this is this a is fourth definition. Syntax. Everybody knows fourth yeah. syntax. <laughs> it's it's not quite fourth syntax. I've never seen like a fork where the definition begin was also a definition end. Never, so never like you don't it. have to. Yeah. Sorry? Oh, I was just saying I've never used fourth. It's not necessary. You could learn it in an hour. <laughs> And uh, and probably have everything you need to know about it. You know, this was like the, yeah, the, I mean, the language of choice mm -hmm. in the '60s for doing embedded systems, and remained the language of choice for doing many embedded systems boot startup sequences for decades upon decades. It yes, might even I, I, still I, be in some boot sequences now. Well, I've, I've heard of it. <laughs> so I think I think like Fort is actually the future of programming. Like you know, it's it's. It should be because, like, I mean, not Fort per se, like, not Fort as a runtime language, but Fort as a compile time language because, like, um, it makes no assumptions about runtime, the machine, and so on. You can code and create languages in it that generate the necessary code without, like, okay, I mean, I can I can show off some code generation demos. So um, it has this fun you can say, run build build and run your own compiler DSL like baked in thing. Yeah. It, it does have some yes. cool shit. But I think the yes. lack of types will, will bite, has bitten me enough that I, I gave up. And the, the forced stack ordering, which is easy to implement and nightmare to program large things in, um, is not, I mean, not what I'm looking for. The uh, the stack ordering, you shouldn't pass more than like one or two items yeah, on the same. Maybe yeah, sometimes three. Somebody does. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't have calls with more than two arguments, but I do, and they make sense. Yes, I mean you so could break up those into and it was names calls. and not stack slots, and that's the reason like, I'm not like all about fourth. Yeah, I mean um, it does allow you to have multi returns, Cameron, as a sort of a standard baked in thing. <laughs> that that's just part of having a stack for your arguments in and out. You can pass back as many as you want to. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is not like Fort per se, like Fort is like, I mean, this uses the Fort ideas of like passing yeah. stuff through stack and like thinking simple and like, um, but like the idea is that um, this is, you never code in this like ever, like you don't ever have like a stack on like, you know, what like a Fort stack, stack on, on runtime, like you only, run this at compile time and then generate something that you can right. run at runtime. No, no, no. But when you're when you are writing code or you're writing code to a stack or to variable so, names. So I, the stack is like um, when I look at the stack I can say like stack reset and then on top of stack for example is like one and two. Uh, yeah. Like you can right. add them and get three, etc. Right. So that's, if that's I press eight Yes, if I press A, for example, I get like 4F. For B, I get like 4F3. I mean, what those mean is if I say A, B, add, uh, it's going to add like RBX to racks, for example. Um, or like I can say like A, B, add to say add uh, RBX to racks. Or I can say like add a type to say like, oh, sorry. Say this should be an integer four byte add, for example, or four byte. Uh, oops, sorry. So like sideways <laughs> f means four byte integer. I haven't, you haven't figured out what's going on here. I think he's doing an underscore u for unsigned four byte. But uh, I'm just guessing. Sorry, sorry. that wasn't uh, like. <laughs> so this is. Um, no, but back up to the a. Back up to the a b. I want to add gets a three. What's the a and the b doing? So um, a and b are just on the stack. Like it doesn't no, no, matter. But what is on the stack? stack? So wipe out everything past the AB. Just come sure. down here. Right. What, yeah. what, okay. And now what's your stack do? You you throw uh, a 4F. What what is what is a 4F mean? Ask exactly. A. So, Not ask so I got this other language for generating, like, you know, writing assembly in a nicer language than like, you know, the uh, yeah. other language for assembly that I have. Yeah. Um, right. so that's here. You haven't, you haven't described this at all ever before, which is fine. I too write, I don't like x86 as a mob, so I 
have yeah. a different x86 asm syntax that's fine yeah. so go back yeah. to your a here you know one two add three a is a yes. a mnemonic for like an intel add instruction or something uh, a is rax b is rbx c is rcx i okay. mean uh, so a b c yeah. here are intel register names exactly exactly so if you say a b add it's going to generate like uh, ah, okay, if you okay. so you have an assembler that uses fourth syntax to assemble x86 instructions exactly exactly okay <laughs> all right we're, we're making progress <laughs> <laughs> well these are yeah. things that that aren't obvious from the get-go and you've been in it so long that you don't realize that we don't know so we're oh, like, yeah, you know. i don't understand what you're trying to do here or what even things mean now i have some more clue here yeah 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 sorry so about that machine machine code code like... or assembly code using four yes. syntax. wait so yes, i have sorry. a question why is a and b when you like push them right when you when you say a it gives you this like pointer looking value that's like four eight something four f yes. or something yeah. yeah shouldn't it be like shouldn't it you get like zero and three for like register zero and register three uh that's here so register zero that's encoded in oh, this and what is four f <laughs> then yeah what so is four f for F is encoding for oh I forgot to explain that right so I'm gonna, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> lots of things. It's all right. Oh yeah, yeah. There's so much stuff it, to it talk feels about. Like, it feels like you're playing a video game of sorts here. <laughs> figured coding out what the, the game, game is yet. Coding the game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can, can so, you can you you know make a redstone computer in Minecraft? Right. No, yeah, I yeah. tried a few days ago. No. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, 4F is, uh, so uh, there is two, um, I had this code generator idea and like before it was like literals, registers, memory, um, and I think it was local variables. I've reduced that down to just literals and variables. So a variable can be a um, memory addressing or like a register. And a literal is just a literal, uh, and like a literal's upper third two bits are zero, so they're just they just work like you know. Uh, so a literal just encodes itself, and like um, a variable has like upper third two bits, so it's like oh, it's not defined here yet, of course, but yeah. So um, the thing is, I got all these like code generators that are like looking at this like you know pattern of like okay, if it's like literal variable ordering, then I'm going to, so this is, the literal would be source and variable would be destination. So I'm going to bind the destination into the RM as like RM, and then I'm going to do destination operation immediate. And like, it's swapped, so like, swap means like, because it's it's for ads, ands, XORs, ORs, like, you know. You're building, uh, this is your assembler code. This is the code that generates the assembler, but they're also written inside this for itself and like you know you, this is still like so this is a similar so i generate code to generate code to generate code to generate code sort of like i just, yeah I, that's cool. <laughs> that, that's a common you might you write your dsl and then you write your your program in your dsl you just wrote so you wrote a exactly. dsl for an x86 assembler now you're writing x86 assembler the dsl you wrote then you want to use yeah. this dsl language to go write some x86 assembler to do something if yes. you want to write an assembler Yes, 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 yes. I mean, um, there is also like the world's smallest like x x x sixty four assembler. Yeah, like right. um, at like how much bytes is this? Like okay, wait, what? Where is it? Oh, I had to. No, you got ninety one thousand eight hundred at the top. Is that the total count of the length of the document here? Ninety one thousand. Where is that? Very top of the screen, above X asm oh. table gen, uh, one one line above that it says nine one eight seven oh. one. Oh yeah, that's like the number of edits. Oh, number like of edits. Various... Yes. <laughs> oh, as opposed to as opposed to okay. Yeah. Uh, so I... Byte size or line numbers or anything else. Oh, interesting. All right. That's so. The size of your so undo weird. buffer. That's what I was. I... <laughs> yeah. I was literally in a say, Wow, that's a big undo buffer. 
Like, it, it was something... Oh, wait, sorry, sorry. I'm checking the XAssembly table. So this table is like two kilobytes or something of data. And then this is the... Um, wait, where is it? Oh, there it is. Okay. So the world's smallest x64 assembler in like 823 bytes. There you go. Like this, all right. This assembles like everything that's like, okay, we can test all, like generate all instructions, and it assembles this like table where like, um, yeah, all of those instructions, including the um, SIMD instructions. In total, it's like um, less than four kilobytes. Like the, the table, for the instructions, like four bytes for each instruction uh, is much more than like the. Um, All right. You know, code. Anyone and else want to so, ask? I'm going I'm to wind this down here. I, I'm amused, but I think you have some some distance to go between. I, and I mean, I started with this kind of stuff back way the hell back in the day, but that was a long time ago for me. <laughs> yeah, it runs a lot faster now than it did in the '80s. Oh yeah, exactly, exactly. And I was using Z80 uh, uh, for quite a while before I got my first 80, yeah. 81, 86. I have an 80, 86. I don't think I ever had an 80, 86. But I had so, a 286. I think I had the one before a 286, too. So oh, no, 80, 86 and 8088 were the same chip, roughly, except the uh, 8088 uh, had the bus, and that got rid of a bunch of transistors, so it was cheaper to make. Uh, you may have also had an 8080 before that. I had a, a Radio Shack Crash 80 was a Z80. I had a color computer that was a 6809. Somewhere in there, I jumped to PCs. It was a very early PC. I, yeah, it might have been. There's a TI PC that was Intel chip based. That was it could in have there been as either well. the 8080 or the 8088. One of the 8080 variants. It might have been an 8088. And then we jumped. All right, never mind. So, so you know, what, what, so, what yeah, I mean, is the goal of the uh, of the problem and language? Do you just explore, or you have something in mind for this? Sorry, can you can you ask the question? Are you again? exploring, or do you have something in mind? Oh well, um, I I built this entire editor in itself, and I'm building like the next version of it in it also, and I'm. Gonna build like a um, application where that's like you know what, what I might Yes. What is week. your what is your goal here? To have fun oh, and the, learn. Oh well, I think this is the future of programming. Like I, I firmly believe in like you know the future okay. is going to be forks because like this is so much simpler than like everything else. I feel like you know it it feels uh, arcane, but it's it's like um, simple enough. I mean, you can understand all of it all at once. Yes, and the like it's it's much more debuggable to write an assembly than like to write in C. I find like most I, I just got used to writing assembly now instead of like thinking about like higher level constructs. Like um, okay, I can just assume that I'm gonna pass this register like uh, as as a base pointer, and I I can assume that I can pass the base pointer in this register and. Like I don't so really from, need from like that, call sense, we legend. really we really caught up that you love low level low level programming, so good for you. Oh, yeah, yeah. But there yeah. there are there are things that are difficult to do yeah. at the assembly level just because of the sheer volume of stuff that has to go yeah. on. At what, at what point Even this stuff that's becomes... not that complicated? Right, a TCP stack in assembly. Uh, that one sounds reasonable up to some limit. Like that's, that's not even that bad. No, but I mean, write really... a, go write an optimizing that... compiler, but you don't care because you're writing an assembly. Um, I don't really think about assembly all the well, all you do, but like you know, there's always yeah, yeah. like help help reverse that are like um, you know, there's there's like um, okay, this is like the source code for the next language. Um, like I can also show you the next language. Well, this is well. Wait, going go, to go, go back one. <laughs> one of the things I'm seeing here is that your font includes up and down arrows, which oh, yeah, is yeah. very very retro and all over around the '80s machines, and not in any modern editor as a standard font that you would write code in. But I can totally see having a single character arrow being a useful character for coding. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 very useful. I find like um, I, I added them when I was like, 
Say again, Cameron? I said we call that a grapheme. I'm sorry, a grapheme. No, you can't do that. Come on. Mm -hmm. too, 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 many, too many new words that mean nothing other than the old words except complicated. Just give me a fucking character that's an up arrow, down arrow. You've got 128 extra above the ASCII seven bits. So, you know, there's plenty of room there. So Heck, you can I'm even also... replace a bunch of the control characters. Like, yeah. like you don't need those. That nobody Vertical needs... tab? What? Ack knack? I'm sorry. When was the last time you used, like, end of transmission as opposed to EOF? <laughs> what? Last time? I I'm certain I used it in the 80s. <laughs> Yeah, that's that. I feel like we've had time to grow since then. I, I just personally, <laughs> maybe, maybe. All right, I'm gonna stop screen share here because I'm staring at myself. Lagged oh, yeah. away. <laughs> like, um, now, so I mean, that's much. that's kind of the language. What what did you think about it? Would you like program in it? Like, you think like ever, <laughs> or is it but like you need too... to see how far it's come since the last time I've seen it? But yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Oh, thanks. Yeah. It looks like you're having a lot of fun, and I think my life is no longer that simple that I can do those things and, you know, make ends meet, fix people's problems. I want to do something bigger. Yeah, I mean, that's like the kind of, like, this is like a very personal language, and if I like, you know, like, I mean, I, I want to show it not... To, to give people an idea like what force could be, right? Like it doesn't have to be like all runtime and like, you know, it, it, it can be, I think Ford as a compile time language is the ultimate language because you can encode, uh, instead of like using like a static predefined language, you can encode with a dynamic language it, that's- very much like a, dynamic yeah, It's very much a language yeah. that helps you write a DSL for another language. And, and in yeah. that sense, it's uh, it's kind of fun and kind of self. I don't know what you call it. There's a word for that, but it's self-built. It eats its own dog food all the time. The word was some metacyclic compiler, maybe. It's yeah, a but compiler that can. Oh, oh, I usually hear the list people call it homo iconic. Homo some, iconic. Okay. Something. Yes. Something. Okay. <laughs> yes. Meta in that circular? sense, it's a lot of fun to go play. And in fact, if you're learning what a compiler is and does and how it works. It really helps to start with fourth and start having fourth compile shit and to see how the fourth compiler does it and then extend and add and, and screw around with it. It, it, it does, it does uh, make it very obvious, the, the connection between the two. It also right, helps Andy. because fourth is a thing you can give to undergrads and get them to actually write the compiler in less than a semester. I would hope so. I was going to start, if I ever did that, I was going to start with even simpler Fourth has white space and uh, as its token delimiter, but I've seen a, a language called mouse where uh, everything was one character, period statement, end of statement, just one character. So parsing was read a byte. That's your parse. That's a separate. I saw a language called Ed where all the commands were one character. <laughs> I used that language, sir. <laughs> what about Wewa? It's like both. Work on what? We want it's, a, it's like APL, but it's stack based. So all the commands are one character, right? So it's APL like, but it's a stack based APL. array language. Okay, it's but you get arrays really, at least uh, up from it, raw. It, it, you get made. You get all the things APL and J yeah, have. Right. It's it's you get like like three dimensional, two dimensional. Like you get well, all of them. Well, n dimensional but, this and that and everything else. Yes. And n dimensional that usually is not useful above three. Yeah, those. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Oh, I've done four yeah. once. Once in my life. Not okay. not not useful more than the dimensions we have in the universe. Okay. Well, like five right. is you pushing. Could throw time in there, but that was fine. I I suppose I. <laughs> <laughs> the beauty of learning about Ed is that moment when you realize that global and then a regular expression and then print, and you're like, wait a second, grep is just an Ed command? <laughs> uh huh. There you go. No wonder that thing's got a funny name. It's named after an Ed command. Generalized regular expression parser, I think. But yes, I was, uh, gosh, that was the Bud Center. I worked on a. Z80 mini computer running the Houston St. Luke's Blood Center data center, data center, whatever that means. One computer, and you had to, whatever. We're talking, I was high school, there I was, was we're talking 80s, early 80s. And it was Ed, was your tool of choice. Done. All right. Yeah, everyone's shaking their head. All right. Move on. Move yeah. on.
Next uh, topic. Ona and I one time were having like a little performance competition because we uh he his language was like uh you know I can write assembly you can't beat that and I totally beat it by using s just by writing better assembly I'm like you know what I'm gonna do packed doubles and 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 ymm it and and like abx to it well, and he's like how did you get it three times faster than mine I'm like I'm just doing floating point he like did a very compact fast integer division and I'm like yeah but I can do four well, there is like a bug here. Look at this bug. Like, oh my god. Can you see the bug on, on the keyboard? Uh, you need to, yes. yes, I see it moving. Yes, no, sir. No. It sounds to me like you have some bugs in Wait. your coding here. <laughs> don't squash that one. That's a friend bug. That's a friend bug. Don't it is. It. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you don't want I it knew the program. keyboard was the source of so, the yeah. bugs. It's an Asian it landed over. on my head yeah, like just a minute ago, and I was like, "What the hell is that?" <laughs> it's an Asian keep away the nasty Don't squish bugs. it. Yeah. yeah, don't don't sure. murder it. You can flush no, it down no, the no. toilet, but don't squish it. No, yeah, it's like I'm gonna take it into like a. Yeah, it can chill, but it's trying. To, it's really trying to get into the computer. Because it's hot in there. <laughs> you know, when I was when All I right. was like, I mean, why don't yeah. you solve your bug problem? I, I got it. Software. I got it. Look at this. <laughs> All software has bugs taken to the extreme. Yes. <laughs> my my wife has a Facebook group she goes to. It's called All Good Bugs Go to Kevin. And Kevin is a etymologist or whatever. He he looks at the bugs and helps people identify what they are and what are good bugs and what are bad bugs and why. All all good bugs go to Kevin. So I will say, as much as I make fun of Alan and his chat jippity obsession, AI is fucking amazing when it comes to identifying stuff. Oh, oh, pictures of bugs and yeah. plants and everything else. Bugs yeah. and plants and stuff. Yeah. Like those apps, I haven't used them myself, but oh. my, my uh, wife and my son use them. And holy cow, they're like spot on almost every time. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah. It, they used to be quite bad, but then they got like good all of a sudden. Like, mm. I oh, think I, what it is, is is there's a web service behind them, and what yeah. it does is when you submit a request, it takes the picture and logs into ChatGPT and says, "Do you know what this is?" And ChatGPT responds, and that just pipes it back to you. Mm -hmm. I remember I was going mushrooming one time, like just walking in the woods, finding random mushrooms, seeing if they're edible, right? And the offline version. Exactly, that's what service, I'm thinking. <laughs> the offline version, while I was while I was offline, right? It said, "Yeah, that's edible." And then I got a notification two hours later saying, "You you should go to the hospital if you ate that." We use our fancy online version, and like you shouldn't have ate that. I'm like, you know what? I'm I'm glad I'm not picking them to eat them. I'm glad I'm picking them to take pictures of them. <laughs> it was like you know our offline model says they're safe, about say, but our some... online model says you will die. Some of them, right? Some of them, uh, the 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 dust from the spores will kill you. And it's not even you have to eat it. You have to be near it and breathe it when you kick it. You have to touch it. Yeah. 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 It, it luckily, it was just one of the ones you ate and then you die. But I didn't eat it. I just touched it gently with gloves. But oh, still. with gloves. Okay, if you're gloves. Yeah, you, you, you glove when you when you glove when you touch a mushroom. You don't. Anyway, look, yes. it's not coffee right. mushroom club. <laughs> <laughs> okay, trying to pivot, trying to pivot back to the programming language. There is a. Hey, we're having yeah. a we're having a tough go of getting locked into programming languages this there morning. There was a I project just, Scala was... that was called Spores, which serializes a closure and send them to the to the server and deserialize them and execute them. And the project was called Spores. Okay. So there there is a there was a funny bug there that if you accidentally capture the, this pointer. Your closure becomes uh, megabytes right. and capture all the programs. So that was a, the project called Spores. So let's go from I can't, there. I can't tell you. I how still many think times if your goal is to debug. serialize code and send functions across the wire, JavaScript is king. We are hmm. very good at sending code across the wire in the form of JavaScript. All right. Yeah. I did no. it with class files, Java class files, but JavaScript's got a pretty good yeah. thing going. Years ago, it was quite common in app servers that someone would accidentally capture a reference to some part of the app server and basically serialize it and yank it across the network. So, you know, you'd have these, you know, 100 megabyte transfers of JBoss and stuff like that, which, of course, never worked on the other side. So, 
but why was the why did the 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 server client who was reading it just like cut you off and just say um excuse me 100 megabytes no well because that takes code that takes yeah logic. it first deserializes the object and then says wait what's this right it's like a, a gif bomb I'm going to serialize for you something that explodes in your face when you when you de when you undo it. Like, why are so, you letting this happen to yourself? Yeah, it's the accidental serialization of stuff yeah. because you get a reference to something from the server, so it calls your method with something that is a veneer onto something else, and it didn't make that pointer transient. So it, you know, then you put that in a property somewhere and you serialize your object, and it just sucks the entire app server into the stream. No, I'm so, like. Uh... And he made your whoops with that, like two hundred Yeah, no, like that. The apps, the, the guy reading the deserializer should have defense against, uh, uh, you know, protocol explosions. It's Java serialization. Yeah. Oh, so there's no defense against anything. So if you, if you have an unbound symbols, why don't you just interpret it that you need to pass it some symbols and nonstop it... set of bugs from. Uh, this problem reminds me of the CEO thing I yeah. talked about a month ago. Which is? Uh -huh. Oh, uh, you you pass in an employee which has a pointer to its supervisor, which has a pointer to uh, the CTO, which points to the C CEO, and then you have access yeah. to whatever your CEO has uh, access to. That was Cameron favorite example with serialized with uh, services capturing what do you the, do? the private state of the app. Right, because at some level everything's connected. Oh no, never. The app server keeps never. a table of sessions and it keeps a and table no of connections and no. a table of this and that. So if you ever get a pointer that points into that mess. You Thank end you. Up, if you serialize that, okay. that, that pointer, you take it uh, all with you. <clears throat> I know I have to deal with serialization sometime soon, but I'm not looking forward. You no, know, not everything's as hierarchical as you think. There was one point where I was writing code that had to deal with the uh, Twitter employee reporting tree. And it turned out it was giving me a bunch of infinite loops. And when I debugged it down, it was because there were cycles in the graph. Hmm. Oh, reporting in cycles? Excellent. Yes, that, there are people would... who report to the person who reports to them. And you're like, <laughs> hmm, okay. That's great. You know, I... I mm. Security by infinite loop. No, it's, it's always interesting to have two employees who each have the right to fire the other one. I, do they actually have, like, reporting firing responsibilities in the cycle? Just curious. Or were they just, like... I report to you on this, along this axis of stuff, and you report to me on this axis of stuff. Um, so this particular tree was the human resources accountability tree of who reports to who, running okay. all the way up to the chairman of the board. <laughs> well, you couldn't run up if you ran into a cycle. Um, and it turned out that there were two small islands that were apparently not accountable to the board because they were their little cyclic islands that were not part of the tree. <laughs> so a, through the system. M a through m reports to l and l reports to nobody yeah um yes. yeah it turned out it was bugs due to acquisitions not being handled properly yeah yeah we, we fixed it <laughs> bugs in the system all right are we are we talking anything to do with programming languages yet I got called by an oil and gas investment company, and I have no clue how that happened. Fine. So the question I had, uh, I've been doing some Rust code, and one of the things you see all the time is this question mark operator, which basically says, if the thing that I've put the question mark after is an error, return the error. And if it's not an error, unwrap the error and Take and the payload value, and keep going. An error. Yeah, so I have a result. So the yeah. result is one of two cases. It is either an OK or it's an error. Yeah. yeah and if it's, it's like an, an error, it will return immediately. Of it has an error. Yeah. Yeah. So you can also do it with optionals. If you hit the question mark on an optional, it will return the none if it's none, and it will unwrap the sum if it's sum. And what was your and question? I, 
what do people think of syntax that may or may not return? Like the thing that makes this weird is that as an if, it would be tricky. You could not write this as a function because the function either does return or doesn't return. It kind of has to be a macro. Right, in line, in place. You basically said right. if error, return error, and then else value so like, is- Is it is useful in your language to have a thing where I'm like, okay, I'm going to call this function f of x, and f of x may or may not cause me to return right here. Yeah, I don't claim so that's a function. It, in, in my language, um, so I don't have exceptions. Uh, I have something like that where uh, you can call a function and then you say error after it, and then you have to handle the error in that block. And that block is expected to uh, return or at least uh, like set the variable that you're supposed to assign to in the function call. But anyway, um, I, I made the error, uh, I made it say error and then open with curly braces because I wanted uh, the error to be highlighted and more obvious. So when you're scrolling through uh, quickly, yeah. you can see that there's an error statements right after the function call. So I, I try to make it somewhat it. obvious. Yeah. But um, yeah, that's that's my opinion. Like uh, I don't, uh, I don't think there's anything too it, wrong with it if it's just obvious. So I'm thinking if you're not throwing, you have to handle these errors at every layer. So you need some short syntax, or you're drowned in large, comp you know, large typing. Yeah, so it saves you from the Go problem. Like in Go code bases, there's always if error not equal to nil, return nil, comma, error, et cetera, everywhere. Yeah. And like, as you were saying, it has to be a macro. It needs, it's not a feature added by a function, so it's more expressive. I think a uh, question mark is, is great. And I think Go made the wrong assumption. I don't think in most cases you do want to um, add some string prefix or whatever have you to add more information. So it's always just returning the error as is. And well, that's what question mark gets you. I like Rust's assumption better that it should be easy. Yeah, when you look at lines of code in Go, you just divide by two because half of them are the same exact line, exact. It's this if error, return it. Oh, yeah. God. Okay. And that totally makes if sense. If result equals equals error, return result. Yeah. Yes. It's one of those things that a, a compiler could do for you. Yeah. Can you can you do a shortcut if you mark something uh, questionable? You don't have to mark anything after it. It will just sure, assume IE, that can fail. Your ID you can just in. so. Uh, no, I mean, uh, I mean, not handle all of the things that can error out with a question mark after it. So if you put a question mark, then the compiler can assume that any function after that can fail. So you can liberate it. Right. To so the other way to do that is to force mark. it on the types and say, if I say int i equals f of x, and f of x returns an option of an i, that's well, if the, it was a none, then blow up. That, and hand that's the making the function back. the function total. You you have a something to return when you don't have something to return. That making that's making the function total. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but that just means you still have to have a flag somewhere that says I'm returning the the not typed int, not the int. Yeah. And then the other thing that feels weird is that. it feels very baked into the language. Like if I want to write my own thing, that's not a result or an option, but an errands option like thing. Now I can't use the question mark operator anymore. You extend like, It's a little return. weird that it's not just calling is sum on whatever the object is and then behaving based on that. Isn't there, isn't there a trait somewhere for question mark or am I thinking it? Yeah, language? it's called control flow, I think. But yeah. it's staying in unstable hell. Um, really? That tends to happen. I was going to say, Rust. if that trait exists, I'm going to go implement it in a few places. Yeah. So there's two parts of it. There's break and continue. Um, and so break with the value exits your function and continue will uh, give you the value that is the result of the question. So yeah, it is extensive. Cool. I've, I've used this. I. 
Was it any good to use it? Uh, no, it was rust. Yeah. Um, right. But I, do you think a feature like this is justified or you should just have a macro system that enables you to return or not return and take it from there? So it doesn't have like doesn't this could be written as a macro. But... Like I'm of the opinion that it is justified, but I'm wondering what other languages besides Rust do. Like, doesn't Swift have question mark as some syntax sugar over option? I wonder what they do. I know Java has the opposite problem that I end up having try except written in a lot of places. But you only had to wrap them once, and you didn't have to go them at every every place up and down the line, right? Like at the Java, you, you wrap where you're going to catch and do something, and it's voluminous. Right. I don't have to wrap all the functions two, in the middle. Two reasons yeah. in Java that you have to catch. One is because you actually have to handle it, and the other is because it's checked. Yes. And then the check finasco is, you know. I was actually working with files this week, so it's really interesting what random things they made require exception handling with IO exception being checked and what things are like, no, no exceptions from this. Right, yeah. Hmm. yeah. That's what, that is kind of equivalent what I said. It's if you mark something, some functions with a question mark, it's like it put the whole block in a try catch block. So you, you just don't need to mark any of the preceding the following functions with the question mark. So it will handle all of them. So it's it's enough to just to mark the first function the first function with a question mark and it will allow you to call the other functions without a question mark. And it's it it should be equivalent to a try catch block on the all on the all block of the uh, the, the whole block of the code. Okay, but if you just have a question mark, you don't have a lot of space for anything else. All you're gonna do is take that exception and then return. I'm asking, like, like, what's the handling here? The, the question mark handling is, I'm just returning. And then my caller has to repeat this ad nauseum. And I'll just put a question mark on main and say everyone just returns and the exception blows out the top. And that's fine. And that's half the time when someone throws an exception, you're just going to die with, you know, unhandled and you don't care. So if you don't have a, a value with the exceptional flow or exception to handle, you have to supply it somehow because the function doesn't know how to return from something that cannot return. And I'm error. increasingly starting to think that Erlang got it right with supervisor trees. Hmm. I've been thinking that the, the good way to do this is to say, at a module boundary, whatever a module boundary is, you have to catch all exceptions and then your module can throw the same exception if you want to, and that's what you do for your catching. But at some point you switch from, it's an it's a free unwind of the stack to the module only ever gets a value from calling another module. And that value may be error and here's my exception, or it may be okay and here's my answer. But at that point you have to decide that your module when get handed crap from the guy that you called is either going to handle that crap or in return something else, or you're going to not handle it and let it flow through, but you make you have to make a call. You must annotate the code. I can deal, I can't deal. I wrote a file, I got a disk full, I can deal, I can't deal. If I can deal, I have to choose now how I'm gonna deal with disk full. Well, that's maybe frees you to throw anywhere inside the module. And it will still, it doesn't it doesn't need because we have to handle it at the end of the of the module anyway. So my my thought was modules get written by different people who don't know what the innards of another module does very well. Okay. So it's kind of sanitation. And at the yeah. boundary of the module, you either have a value or you force to handle it. So it's yes. Kind of... yes, you have to sanitize yourself when you call somebody else's module. When your module calls a different module, you have to sanitize the return result. Mm -hmm. That's what I was trying to get at. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a better way to say it. Cool. Next All topic. Right. <laughs> well, I want to. I didn't get a chance to say anything. So I have a very simple line of reason. Okay. So the first question is, how many exceptions are there? All right. And All right. so the answer is there is an unbounded number. I literally looked like the kernel. The cur you 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 do a system call, right? It can give you. 
any number between like negative 4,000 and zero, okay? You, and you don't know what these codes are. It can just come up with new codes at any time. There is literally no contract at all. I mean, so you basically, either you handle 4,000 unique error codes, and then you, they can always add one more, right? I mean, they'll just change the or, code. Or you handle them all. By splitting them, by splitting well, so the, the point, sections. The there's always a catch-all because you aren't going to actually write 4,000 exception handlers. You're going to write one exception handler that handles pretty much all the ones where you do, where you do something that you don't you, that you don't care about, right? You're like. So okay. do you want a language where the only exception is exception? No, no, no. I'm not done yet. So there are interesting exceptions, right? Like you know, end of file or something is. Well, sometimes... why is that an exception? Well, why is that? That's the question. Okay, yes. Oh, maybe I should have started with what is an exception. The answer is what is not an exception is a normal value. Anything else is an exception. Um, What's normal? But you know, this this question gets recursive here. Don't don't bother. Well, it's, it's simple. I've I've defined it to be normal, so therefore it's normal. So yeah, but but I don't like your definition. So I have my own standard for normal. Oh well, let's see. So so here's the question: Is one a normal value? Well, it depends what radix I'm using. I mean, it's more normal than out of memory. <laughs> See, so, so I mean, there, I think there's, there's a, I think you can, it's fairly easy to draw a hard line, you know, like one is normal and then out of memory error is not, right? Yeah, and, and what about disk full? Well, that's also an, an error of their exception. It's an out of memory. Okay, how about file like you have to. That's you have awesome. to handle like anything. Anything you're going to come up with that's not a normal value is going to be weird, and therefore an exception. I'm, I'm 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 working it down the the hierarchy of weird here. So I claim file not found is so common that I would claim if I ask for a file and it comes back not found, one of the the, the API should be it doesn't throw an exception. It tells you it found it or it didn't. Okay. Okay. Here's a litmus test. Okay. I am a programmer in a hurry, and I just want to write. A simple, straightforward program that works, okay? And the question is, is it, can I ignore the error and crash if it, and the, and so for example, file not found, I can ignore that. I can assume that the files are in the directory because I'm just writing a script and I don't care if it's missing. I'll just crash the program. So there you go. No, the thing is like, in a, in a real program that you have to show like a, display UI that tells the users file not found. I mean, why does that have to be an exception instead of like something that's a return code when you're well, trying no, to open no, the, the point yeah. is not that that's the point. It's not a real I can write a real script that just says open file, process yeah. CSV, uh, write results. I do it all and, the time. I'm totally with him on this one. Yeah. Right? And yeah, if, I, if file isn't found, I can just crash the program and give a stack trace. And that is a perfectly reasonable result for a throwaway script that I'm doing for Cliff's, you know, bottleneck challenge. Yeah, I want to figure that out in my language too. It, like, I, I don't want, if I'm just testing something, I don't need to handle all the errors. Right. I mean, that's basically what I do in my Rust code is I write unwrap on almost every function call. Go get the thing and pretend it was fine. And go get the thing and pretend it was fine. And go get the thing and pretend and, it was and, fine. And unwrap <laughs> throws out to the, you know, out to the kernel. Yeah, the unwrap says if this thing is an okay, unwrap it, and if it's not an okay, panic. Oh panic. god. Yeah. yeah. Like, okay. what's the point? Like, if it's going to crash, like it was going to crash anyway. No, like, no, you have to be type safe. So do he's doing it. He has right. to put the syntax point in is language that to let him do it. It makes the compiler shut up until yeah. <laughs> I've got a thing that at least has the happy path working. And right. then once the happy path does what I want the happy path to do, now I can go back and think through, okay, what are all the cases that I want to handle if things go bad? That's but I usually don't want to write my error handling code until I've at least gotten the happy path, happy path working, working on the idealized case because I don't want that context in my head. I want to solve the problem with the context in my head and then dump all that context and go, Okay, how do I want to handle the errors? Does oh, ninety-nine sure. percent of people have the lynch or complain about that when you publish? Oh, geez, dude, dude, I, I published the... Hotspot. How many unhandled cases were there inside of Hotspot? Unlimited. What do you saw? Uncountable numbers. Alan was saying hundreds and thousands of places where shit would go wrong and crash and burn, 
and we slowly, lazily over time clean them out, and they're still in there, and you just call it a bug in the compiler, the bug in the runtime, bug whatever, but there were lots of them. And you couldn't deal with them all on the spot. You just didn't know what to do. So a badly timed C malloc out of memory will bring a hotspot JIT down. I mean, a hotspot uh, runtime down. It won't catch and throw a GC out of memory. It'll die because a malloc failed. Malloc never fails. Exactly. So if I say unsigned A equals unsigned B minus unsigned C, should my compiler well, com blow up at me and say, hey, you subtracted an unsigned thing from an unsigned thing. That could go negative. You better you check this the number's not negative right here and handle yeah, it. You, you assign the result to an unsigned. Right, exactly. And you're going to annotate every possible piece of code that happens. You're just doing like little tiny plus minus one index calculations on an array bounds. No. Yeah, the number of times where I'm writing if A less than B, okay, do the unsigned thing. Yeah. Else do the subtract the other way. You're like, no. My else is something that never happens. Right. And yet. And yet you had to write it. <laughs> or I write if A less B, go the other side, panic. And my yeah, else right. is just explode. And it's like, do I need this else here just to tell me to explode if the thing that I know will never happen will never happen? Exactly. I fought this with several languages. And yes, it becomes very annoying. I often I mean, end up some, writing wrappers. There are some good that... rules of thumb, though. Like, exceptions are non-local in their nature. Right, it's a it's a form of non-local handling. Yeah. So, if you're in a place, by the way, Tito, there's something moving behind you. Uh, if you're in a place, um, uh, you know, where you do something and you have to handle a result, never use an exception. Never, right? Because like that's a result. That's not an exception, right? But if you're somewhere and you know, it's one of those things, that, you know, that should never happen. You know, you've seen that comment before. This will never happen. This will never happen is what we used to write before we had exceptions. Mm -hmm. Right? No, so every should, time should, you, should you propagate information with the type about service information about what can go and cannot go wrong? That's what <laughs> like, types tell you. When you want to go on them, this should never happen because... In my case, I would write an assert today, and I would expect this to abort. Yeah. To abort? Uh, what I do in my oh, code wait, is wait, wait. I have abort? an Everybody always macro. Panic. Abort the server. It's the no, same no. as Aaron's panic. The point is, is one person's exception is another person's abort. Hmm. All an abort is is yes. an unhandled exception. Yes. Abort is fail fast. Crash right there. Abort no, abort. he's saying. If I wrap Matt's code that has an assert as a service and I want to call the service and Matt fails because some internal bug and his assert triggers, I do want my service to go down. I just got to acknowledge that Matt can't give me an answer. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can kill the whole Matt pile because. Sorry, Matt. Because <laughs> if it's infected by whatever happened, you don't want to. This is the Erlang model. Right, yeah. there's no panic person. Well, I yeah. I can't speak authoritatively on Erlang, but um, you know the idea is that that there's some boundary at which the error kills whatever's inside that boundary, and then and it gets restarted. People outside survive that border getting killed. Right. I think that is a a useful way to what is damage control for bugs. Right. So don't think yeah. of exceptions as being things that are recoverable. Think think about them as you know things that generally should never happen but could, right? So there's no way to locally handle that exceptional result because it's primarily because it's so unanticipated. That's why we have another division, an error and an exception. No, I don't want to get too many of those. So. <laughs> There are errors so, like I'm, I'm, I know what I'm going to tell you that it's not good, and an exception is I don't know fucking what's going on. Something in, a, <laughs> in a non garbage collected language, I think uh, you should not have an exception. Well, you're, the reason you're, I'm guessing the reason you threw out garbage collection is that with garbage collection, there's some amount of cleanup happens on state, but it is the case that there's other state that is not garbage collected on, on a crash. Can leave things broken. Somebody's got a cache of whatever things 
They're using the necessary for performance. They have also got a bug. The bug crashes them. Somebody says the GC will clean it up and they carry on, but now their cache is corrupted and they start returning bad answers all the time because they have internal state. So I'm, I'm just thinking, don't yeah, if you use can restart, GC as a, we can recover this particular piece or not. Yeah. I, I I restart. Uh, I, I catch like memory errors in my editor, and if like if it's like a um, psych fault, then I just don't care about it. Restart for a safe place, and then keep going because like they happen all the time. Like I I could even like run a thread and then catch like infinite loops and say like okay, you know what? Do you want to kill <laughs> or? But I don't because like I just yeah. Sometimes well, those happen. Common. That's a common strategy for, for application servers. Somebody has a request comes in, the request takes too long, eventually they think maybe it's just gone infinite and you kill it, try the request yeah. again or deny and say, no, you can't have whatever question you asked. But yeah, yeah, timing out uh, uh, services is a thing and killing it. And if you kill the whole service and garbage collection picks up, then you know what Lebo said makes sense. Yes, the GC lets you clean up the mess. But there was some resource management that went at the level of things that got killed. Whereas if you throw an exception and you, the 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 guy who threw it didn't do any cleanup, uh, you know maybe he doesn't he needs to be killed. You don't know whether or not that thing that threw the exception at the time you catch it is is valid anymore or not. Yeah, yeah. The problem is trying to anticipate, like. Yeah. Whatever the programmer intended before they, whatever they intended, like I think, like uh, languages approach this problem as like, okay, we have to have like a very uh, defined like runtime, and like here are the memory semantics. Like this is what happens if like out of bound access happens. Like maybe it panics or maybe it's like throws an exception or whatever. I think it should be configurable at the like meta language level. Like okay, like if like you know what is like a safe state or like what, what is like an exception so you could have like multiple ideas of exceptions or like um you know panics or whatever like coexisting in the same like program space like because otherwise it's just like this is the language's anticipation of what an exception would be you know and like that's like kind of like rigid until the next version exception 2.0 comes along <laughs> like you know like that's the central problem with like any language that's like um like defined that has a defined runtime as in like here are like you know here's a language as rigid and defined and like you know this is like the runtime yeah, that I, it's supposed to have I, the, the, those languages that have these defined runtimes give some other things in exchange for taking away some things. And what they give is often considered better than what they take away. And that's yes. the reason people use them. Yes. Like the idea is if code can, different philosophies can coexist together, right? If I can define this, whatever the runtime of Erlang would be in this meta language, like the con constructs of those runtime, like, um, I think they had like channels or something. yeah they have they have <laughs> separable, right? separable like, communicating processes the communication protocols were well discussed or well typed and then the theory was if any one process went down you could restart it or people were talking through a channel and so the failure that you got through the channel was limited to what the channel could describe and so it was easier to recover from a failure at the other end yeah. I'm talking through a wire. The other guy can't shoot me down. All I can tell is curse words through the wire. But usually just the wire goes dead or has static on the line or something. But he's not killing me. Whereas if it's open shared common memory like a standard processor has, then he can stomp all over me and there's no limit to how widespread the damage can be. And that's the reason we have OSs. So that mistakes in your program don't wipe out everything else on the box yeah. because virtual I mean memory guards you. It's like a lot of processes running in the same process without crashing and stepping on each other's toes. Yeah. And like they're sharing uh, memory in the process so that it's also efficient well, there, at that right. level. There's a question. Like, How do you arrange the sharing boundaries so that you can enforce the safety of the neighbors? You have, you have a bunch of related processes that are trying to accomplish maybe, but they're not necessarily all safe, good neighbors. 
how can one neighbor, what can you do to stop one neighbor from shooting another one down? Right. And so, yeah. and so if you have unbounded pointers, that's, you know, that's that problem. So then you get into like sandbox languages is Java where you get to OS is sandboxing your process. He's, he's saying you can't go shoot thy neighbor's grep or terminal down or steal his uh, shell and ask for his passwords. Yeah, yeah. I, I think like the ultimate interface for I was thinking about like a next generation operating system where like processes could coexist with the end. Like it has to be like memory like isolation, right? Your process gets like some growable memory space that it can right. grow into, and like um, if it needs to make an OS call, it makes next generation. Memory. Isn't this the, the current generation of OSs have this? I, I don't think so. It's like syscalls or galore, like, you know, it's all has to go into the kernel mode to do. Like, well, but whatever. that's exactly what the OS is. It is the kernel. I mean, you could say like, okay, I'm going to have these sort of like, I'm going to sub subscribe to these sort of events. Like as soon as I have keyboard input and my app is focused, whatever, like, you know, give me the keyboard input or like, you know, I'm going to read the keyboard inputs at this memory offset. Right, so that memory no, offset the app no. knows to read. No, you know, like, no, no, no. <laughs> like the no. OS updates that, so like you know, it's still like when the application is focused, that keyboard input gets like updated that's, or like when it's that's not. That's how it's we zero. did it in 1980. That was perfectly reasonable back then when our floppy drives had 100 kilobytes and we had a total of one program running at any given time. Total. I mean. I don't think the modern OS can run one program even like very good, but yeah, I mean you're using one now. Yeah, I mean it's kind of sort <laughs> of working. Looks, looks I'm like, so, How many so programs are on your phone? The phone's yeah, running I mean, a modern OS. <laughs> Have the you last guys time ever... my crash was like last time my browser crash was today. Like, <laughs> yeah, so I I distinctly remember getting input from a position in memory. So a key press was. The, the key pre the current key press was in a position in memory. You had a one character buffer from the keyboard. Like this should sound familiar, Cliff, right? Like yeah. But but the point is, at some point we said, you know, what we really want is for someone to come to the application and say, hey, someone pressed A, someone pressed B, someone pressed C, and if the application's a little slow and it doesn't, you know, handle A. It doesn't lose B and C just because it didn't handle A, right? So the you know the concept of queues, the concept of events, and so on. And the fact is that might not even be a computer with a keyboard. It might be a you know might be a VM in a server somewhere with fake keyboard input because you're testing, you know, you're testing a trillion different combinations at the same time on different VMs, and you know so so separating hardware from events correlated with hardware is a you know it was a pretty dramatic step forward in our industry it's, and i certainly wouldn't want to go back it happened quite a while ago oh no no, no. i mean like okay Before still the process has its own memory think of it in the modern way but instead of making an os call to give give me the keyboard input like you know all the time like the os knows which memory to update because like the os gives like okay you know what here's a standard but input it's not, for like it's not all which the memory to update it's where to place the message in the queue yeah have you used uh iou ring uh no I, that's not that. yeah it's, that's it's basically async uh, system calls. Uh, they don't support uh, Linux doesn't support all the system calls, but uh, a lot of them you could just say uh, uh, every time you get a, like a, a socket or uh, if your file finished reading or whatever, you can say give me a, a message and then you can just process it using a, uh, C++ Atomics, like uh, like Atomic reads, and you could just like process everything and. Uh, Put more onto the queue, and the OS would uh, grab it. But the thing is, it's actually uh, not performance if you only have a few. So you actually just want to just put a queue with a bunch of uh, OS uh, or a bunch of OS calls. Call tell the OS you put stuff on the queue, and then let it handle it, and just give you all the answers all at once. And that actually like that's actually pretty performance if you don't have to, if you're not too busy. <laughs> So on all these things, there's 
first of all, the notion that one process running on this box can't harm another and the OS keeps them separate. Whether or not the communication of like hardware into your process is done via mapped memory or via callbacks or via syscalls, those are all API choices. And they have different latencies depending on the volume and throughput rate. If you're waiting for a keystroke on an input by reading a piece of memory, you have to spin loop waiting for it to change, which burns a whole processor. And oh, that's yeah, I mean, wildly inefficient. That's why the Linux IO ring is slow. You yes. could still say, like, you know, here's like the queue count, and then instead of like pulling the each input from the queue, I want to see the whole queue that's like queued instead of like making an OS call for like give me the next you, one. Like, you can you know, imagine a, memory. you can imagine like, any kind of OS interaction you'd like, but still the OS's job is to keep one process from crushing another and generally keep you unaware of what the actual hardware looks like because the hardware does rotate and change fairly often. So okay. Asking for, I have a queue, the OS is going to update it, I'm going to update it. That's done. That happens. Those are things that are real life because of the certain latency categories people land into. I want to say Solar On Flare, one of these networking guys, has, has a variation. But there's a bunch of this kind of stuff floating around. It happens. It's, it's alive. But still the OS's job is to keep one guy from getting smashed by another. And, the, and having that exposed queue does not make you give you access to the ability to smash somebody else. I so mean, you I saying, have some like, OS I, wish list. Like, if it was just not for us, like, why doesn't OSs, for example, like, protect the file system? Like, because, like, it means that the browser has to be the separate OS that's, like, sandboxed inside, like, a... Okay. Um, so, so that's what it, what it does. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. And, and go, you go first, Cameron, but yeah. Uh, wait, wait, wait. I just want to say uh, Linux has... a. Uh, containers now uh which basically docker is built on top of that yeah, does some of it but i agree though i should be a little bit better with that go cameron well, the file system came along as a separable piece from the os for a long time so there's a long history here and then people started putting priorities and privileges and and protections on the file system but in general file systems were considered open and fair game not to be protected by the os other than standard permissions and then that was eventually decided that's kind of a dangerous thing. And then there has to be a better way to do that. And so you can get protections on your file system if you go I mean, them. you have something like that on Linux. It's called C groups for control groups, which allows you to control which process can access which file system in which way. It's actually what containers are built on top of. But you only need C groups for that. You don't actually use ah, containers. I thought that was for only CPUs, but no, it does everything. No, else. the Linux container technology is built up on C groups. But okay. if you only want this this capability like feature, then then you only need C group. Like how many commands do I have to type in to make it work? And like you know, Leva can probably do this in two days. <laughs> but, but the big problem, Anna, the big problem is that. You know, when they designed security on the file system on Unix, a typical operating system, the full install and everything on it after a couple of years of using that computer was 75 files. That's it, like 75 files. You know, that was the whole thing, right? Nowadays, you know, if you look at the cache in Firefox, it's 417 trillion, 385 billion, 791 million, 862,147 files. And that's because I haven't cleared it in two weeks, right? Like the, the, the granularity that they started with was too, too fine grained. And, you know, we, we just outgrew it. Like, yeah, I mean, maybe we should go back to the, like every program has its own database file system, like you know, like well, kind of, yeah, memory. Right, it's it's not, it's like not a, a horrible idea. Yeah, um, but you have to make it, you know, you have to make it simple enough to manage and simple enough to visualize and simple enough to understand, right? And that's that's the thing is we need sometimes we need better abstractions to kind of collapse all the complexity that we accrued over fifty years. No, 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 dependencies, no. <laughs> you want it to be very simple and no abstractions. That's the yeah, best that's way. What, that's what Unix is. Go back then. to Unix 1974. You've got everything you ever need. So what what level have you against abstractions? What is abstraction to you? 
so when people talk about abstractions, it's yeah. they they usually mean more than one levels. So one level is fine by me. Sometimes two levels is fine, but when you have five, you're not going to understand everything and you're going to have bugs all the time. Just it's actually straight. You can write pretty straightforward code if you just have uh, no layers of abstraction or just yeah. one. Like it's so simple. That's why I don't like dependencies because instead of trying to debug the thing or reading docs for an hour, I could actually just go fix it in like 10 minutes. I get it. That said by someone who's never built an HTTP server. Yeah. I, I, I did. I did. It wasn't very good, but it worked. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, yes, there's, I don't like the abstractions, but I recognize that they're just too useful and I don't want to know how everything works, but I do like my abstractions to be very simple and clean. And I would claim that HTTP as an abstraction is not that one. Yeah. What, what's nice is when abstractions kind of follow a step model, like, I don't know how to explain it, and, but you know, the, you know, like step functions and math, right? Mm -hmm. But it's nice, you know, it would be nice to have an abstraction for HTTP, you know, that, that, you know, so you wouldn't have to build HTTP, but it would also be nice to have an abstraction for TCP, right? And it, you know, so it's like, you kind of have these different steps and, you know, it'd be nice to have a, an abstraction for IGMP under that. And it would be nice, you know, like, each one of these things you'd like to be able to go in and use directly or just go all the way up and say, you know, I want to use a RESTful web service, right? So even like higher Cameron, level than... I think I misheard you. I think you said you like a web RTC or I forget what it's called, the RPC. And then you like TC, uh, TTP too as an abstraction for TCP and so on. No, I heard ICOMP, but um, the, the packet... I didn't say it right. The, the packet yeah, layout. IGMP stuff, yeah. Yeah, packet layout. Right, because basically you want to be able to jump in at the level that's of interest to you, whether you're replacing something or consuming something or whatever. So you want to be able to... You, good abstractions are composable, right? And they allow you to slide in your abstraction under something else that was written before you sorry, your implementation of an abstraction to slide it in under something else that was built on someone else's implementation of the same abstraction. Like, uh, for example, this week, one of the things that, that totally pissed me off for the 45,000th time is that, you know, Java's files and directories are not abstractions. They're, they're hardwired, right? So you can't write your own file system because file system in Java is global. There's one, right? So you can't have a fake directory that you implement what's behind it, right? So everything is built on that abstraction, but the abstraction is irreplaceable. Therefore, it's only, I don't know how to say it, but it's half an abstraction, right? It, it abstracts away the OS, but nothing else can sit behind that abstraction other than the OS itself. So it's, it's, it's not that it's useless, it's that it's shockingly castrated in terms of what its utility could do. So in, in getting the Java on compiling Java, Java C compiler at runtime, they they build a new file abstraction so that I can have source files in byte arrays instead of on disk to feed into the Java compiler. But there's a whole file system abstraction layer that was pretty made near as I can tell just for the Java C calling yeah. Java C. That's a pretty heavy lift. Yep. That's a pretty heavy lift, yeah. Yeah. And the NIO stuff did clean it up some. So I'm, you know, I'm criticizing something that's mostly 30 years old. So like, give me a break. You know, there's nothing I wrote 30 years ago that still works. In other words, they, they did an awesome job. It's just in retrospect, you can see what some of the things that could have been better were. So how about the quote by uh, Dijkstra? I'm going to read it. The purpose of abstraction is not to be vogue, but to create a new semantic level in which one can be absolutely precise. So how does it fit into the picture? He's yeah. a smart guy. Yeah. Yeah. It's not what happens in real life very often. Sometimes it does. Hmm. I mean, think about computers. Transistor is an abstraction that there is such a thing as a digital device, but there is no such thing. There are only analog devices with massive voltage levels, which can be very, very 
unwieldy for humans to reason about. But if you can convert this, if you can make an abstraction where you only have to think about zeros and ones, then you can be very precise about what you are building on, and then you can be okay. small on top of that. Yep. Yeah, but they, because they represent is a fine abstraction. Because they, the transistor kindly represents a state, and uh, it's kind of, it kind of stabilizes things and trades more transistor for more states. So it's kind of useful abstraction, I think. Well, yeah, it's useful because mm -hmm. I don't have to think about analog physics. I can think about zeros yeah. and ones exactly. Well, right. and, and analog physics are messy because there is no such thing as zero and there is no such thing as five volts. There's yeah. Yeah. close to zero and there's close to five volts. Right. right? Mm -hmm. I was just looking this week at the uh, sheriff, uh, Ken Sheriff published some updates on the 386 and some other things. And he's the guy that reverse engineers the CPUs, but he was showing the way the registers work. And they're basically, it's an eight transistor, the, the Intel 8086 registers were eight transistors, but basically, it's two not gates in a loop, right? So, and that holds it, it so half of it is zero, the other half it's one, and then it right. just repeats, repeats. So it's 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 basically, that that's it. It's eight transistors to implement two not gates in a in a circle. And, they, and then there's some other clever stuff where they can both read it. And they're flip-flopping it every clock cycle because otherwise the bits fade away. The voltages leak off and it's I didn't dead. actually look into the the mapping of the cycles to the um the, I, I don't know what the what the cycle mapping was to it, but yeah. It's interesting. All right. Like have you ever looked at GCN's instruction design? Like it's it's stellar. Like now it's RDNA. Like if you look at the instruction set architecture, it's it's incredible how they designed it. Like they support so many instructions for the variable length instruction set and like um i'm sorry what, compared what? To like uh, what was the name uh, of this AMD AMD. GPUIP. yes i mean i can send like on the chat like rdna3 isa i'm sorry I, I matt you said something and then somebody else said something it's and an I... amd gpu and gcn oh. stands for graphics store next like, that was the code name for micro architectures yeah, okay, for GPU. Yeah. Like it's interesting because many GPUs evolved from VLIW. One could even say that GPUs are the most successful mainstream VLIW evolution we have today in the market. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're 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 vector like you know six or thirty two wide now. Like um, I mean the SIMDs are thirty two wide, and there's like four of them if I remember correctly, like per work group and like. Um, I mean, not work group. Sorry, the uh, uh, the compute unit, the work work group processor. It's also many <laughs> like, strategy. Yeah. And like the the programming model is like uh, I think much more interesting than like programming like CPUs. Like I'm looking forward to the days where we're going to program like servers with GPUs, perhaps. Like now they they're not going to be HTTP or whatever, but like. You know, like I think CPUs are so like boring. They, they, they got all the like 16 register, and like you with ARM always, you got 13 registers, but like you can always blame what's your use use one, case? but they got us where we're at. What's your right. use case for GPUs in the server? Well, um, I don't know. <laughs> that's that's like it. It's like. Um, the, the the point is like you're doing these um you, like you could have the database on on the GPU and like uh, you're just copying bytes around and like you know you can you can I make think, it part of I think, it, like I, I think you need yeah. to clarify your thinking some by doing some of this and and uh, <laughs> see if you can produce some sort of interestingly useful database on a GPU I think that would be very interesting to see but I think it was non-trivial and I think that's the that's a lot harder like, than a lot. interesting use case, for example, would be like, why would you use like a GPU on a database, for example? Well, you like, guy brought it up. Yeah. Because I want I, to do a query. I have yeah. some amount of data, it fits on a GPU, and I want to ask a question. Yeah. And, and is that faster, better, easier, cheaper? Maybe. I think uh, so, because like you would be probably doing like, you know, 
a proxy is matching, which you can still implement with like whatever operations you have on the GPU. Go, go, right? go look at the TCPH queries and imagine <laughs> putting that data on a GPU and then running those queries, the TCPH queries. I was in the other room. Did you say anything about SIMD? I didn't say anything about SIMD. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, try uh, using SIMD instead of uh, the GPU and see if you like SIMD on the server. Because that's something I like to do. It I mean, does give you the flavor of vectorization in the small, in, a, in, a, in an easy, manageable way. Like, okay, you got, like, you well, can hey. think of, like, you know, you got one query job running on, like, one um, work group, like, which could be as low as 32 threads, right? And you can run, like, what? Um, but 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 you're not you're 60 not, of those per I, work I think, group processor and like you know thousands okay, of those per that, that, so that, instead of like having that, like a cpu with like 64 okay monat i muted you because you're not listening to anyone else and you're charging ahead with some concept in your mind and i'm just doing moderation here because you're pretty far away from reality and um, we're trying to bring you back and it's not working Okay, so sorry I had to mute, but that that's we're 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 keeping the conversation a little on track. I, I do have something concrete that maybe might help you. I put out a, a, a CSV reader challenge a, a month ago. The numbers came back from different people implementing them in their favorite languages. It has a big data flavor. It has a flavor that you could imagine running either on a GPU or on SIMD. You could also just write Python code to go make it happen. It's just complicated enough to not be trivial and just simple enough that everyone thinks they can write it. And the speed varies between implementations by 8x or something between the fast and the slow. There's a big speed gain difference between how people approach the problem. So it's something to think about as a way to, oh, add some reality to the complexities of, of using fancier hardware to get something to go. There, there's there's a, a something in your head, this looks really cool, but I don't see you having the concrete, this is how problems get solved and how they're solved right now and why they get solved this way to match it. So I'm okay. saying open your- I solve problems with it a lot. Like I'm writing like GP codes, I'm writing like I'm you know, a lot of stuff with it. Solve like... somebody else's problem, not yeah. your own on purpose because other people's problems won't so perfectly slot into what you have. And you need to sure. widen your vision of what a problem is and how they get solved. So I'm just trying to bring up a little data, bit wider. Actually, I just think of like, okay, here is like a program that's like, you know, we're doing like, what is, what is its data? And like, how do I access this data through which words? And like, which, right. what and, kind and of like, what I'm is, is like most what I people's problems don't look like that. That's not where they're coming from. Really. You don't get a program with data that's lined up and you're trying to like get the words out of them. That's not what the program, that's not what the problem looks like. Two traders most, are trying to trade some, something of value. Tell me, a problem, tell me one problem like that's like, you know. <laughs> No, no. By the time it gets down to words in memory, the problems have gone through a huge amount of, of cleanup and idealization, perfectization, whatever you want to call it, to bring them from the real world. I'm trying to, to grow food in the ground and I'm trying to pay off the diesel and the repairs on my tractor and the, the money I spent for seed and, and harvest gear and people and stuff. And I have to go take this piles of wheat and turn it into cash to go pay off the guys who ran the tractors that took the wheat out of the field. Okay, turning that into a computer problem, that's a long, long ways away. But that's the real reason that we eat today because it was solved. So there is a hard problem there. And mm -hmm. one of the ways that gets solved is it turns into the price for wheat in the commodities exchange market, which eventually turns into some very very idealized, perfected mathematical stream of log events of who traded what with who for how much money and who owes what and who didn't pay and who has to go to jail because they're not paying, who should pay more or less, and this is cheap and the you know, crop failed there, blah, 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 whatever. Those important things make the world go round 
they don't ever start by looking like computer programs with data in them. So mapping that down to a computer program usually involves a huge amount of flexibility and a huge amount of simplifying assumptions that are bullshit, but they had to be simplified. Now that they got simplified and I have something I could do something with on a computer, the answer is only sort of problem, sort of piecemeal solving their problem. It tells me a little something, but I still have to go run the tractor, get the food out of the field. So, yeah. you know, I'm saying widen your perspective a little here. No, no, yeah, I totally and, like, okay. I and, get and, the trying to express complex problems is what you're saying essentially, right? We have this like really complex problems that we're trying to express. I'm saying you personal personally problems. need to go tackle somebody else's problem and yeah. see how well your tools solve their problem. Because I kind of think that most like people's problems are problems. boring. Yeah, I, I kind of think. Why well, most people's problems are boring, Dave? <laughs> yeah, I think most people are boring. Are boring. Is a common problem, too. <laughs> <laughs> but other like people know how... the food you eat, and so you have to pay them, and that's a problem like, for you. The, the problem is, I can't actually convince people to, like, you know, um, to give this, like, okay, let's program everything from scratch idea a shot. Like the way I would program like a HTTP server is I wouldn't write HTTP at all. I would just use web right. transport. Okay, like, so, so hang on. Like, but what yeah. you just said was, I don't like how other people do it. I think I can do better. Yeah. This is a case where you can present a better answer. I saw your very cool looking fourth programming doing assembly things. That's interesting. It's not going to solve my problem. It's not a better answer for me. It might be a better answer for somebody else. I don't know. If you want to come along and say, I don't, wouldn't use TCP or I wouldn't use HTTP to connect between people communications, that has a built in drawback that you immediately deny the 99% of the world who will only be using HTTP. Now, when I did uh -huh. an H2O cluster, I wanted to have cluster communications between the members of the cluster. I did not use HTTP to talk to members of the cluster either. Fine. I mean, but that solved my cluster problem. And that cluster itself gave me a solution for a different problem that other people were interested in. They don't fucking care how I talk between the nodes in the cluster. And I didn't care for HTTP. Fine. But if you say, I'm not going to talk HTTP, who you're not talking HTTP to? Every browser on the planet, every server on the planet. I mean, it's still like HTTP, there's still HTTP 3 involved, but I'm not going to do HTTP requests. I'm going to do like custom binary transfer requests instead of like, you know, okay. making the server HTTP. So right? custom binary yeah. transfer, blah, 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 what H2O was doing, solved a very specific narrow problem, which was very useful in that domain, but didn't solve anything else. And it didn't let me talk to other people. I had to have a normal HTTP server buried in an H2O instance so you could talk to it with a browser. That was just part of the thing. So I'm just saying, you're, you're thinking, I have this super better answer. Yes, you, you do for efficiency, but not for the broadness of the world. So I'm saying, pick a broader problem that's not yours because yours will only have things that you can solve instantly and, and force yourself to pick somebody else's problem. Like, what do you do for a living? You, somebody pay you right. for something? And what problem are you I, trying to solve for them? I was working on a um, cloud VR streaming platform where we okay. were trying to like stream, like, you know, um, anyway, I can't really talk that much about it. No, no, you don't have to talk about it. I'm saying in that domain, is what you're doing now going to help? I mean, I was using C and I'm looking at the code and like, oh, this 3000 line of C code, I can write in my language in like 500 lines and it would be much cleaner because like, I wouldn't have to like repeat like, you know, I mean like, and C as in like, you know, it's like the next best thing I think like. Right. Uh, so for, so, for so I, I think here I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help broaden your your excitement into helping other people but it's not really coffee club and it's not really oh, yeah. broadly it's interesting to a lot of people so i, I think that we should we oh, should yeah. pivot away here and maybe it's time to wrap this one up um i mean it's it's um i actually want to like publish this language also if people would be interested but i okay. think it's such a personal language that's like you know and like right. if people are interested they can okay. actually okay. like write their own and like okay. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. You have the power to publish in your hands. 
you don't need to explain it to us. Do so if you wish. Just go to you know GitHub and and put it out there. But let's leave it off of Coffee well, Club. Right now. Gets, like, sorry, I, I yeah, you're I'm you're ready. you're excited, and when you get going, you're hard to stop. That was that was <laughs> that's an issue, but we're working on it. All right. Oh, not much compiler stuff today. Oh, Alan's trying to say something. Sorry. I just need to mention. So, like, I mean, so Cliff mentioned his his you know challenge. So I, I put a link in the Google Doc. So to to my uh, ah. my GitHub repository. So you just run, you know, you run the the Gen Java program to get the CSV, and then you you have to do the same thing as bandwidth.com. Yeah. And so, right. You know, there's. There's other people's examples. There's my example. If you want to try out, if you want to, if you can't read Java, I never got the Swift to fucking install. I still want to try your example, but fine. That's yeah, a different I, problem. Swift is being Cliff, me. I was actually like, you know, I was trying to do the same. Like I was trying to broaden your horizons, like to like, you know. Why don't we have this conversation say. offline, not recorded yeah. live, and sure. and and we can we can talk about stuff that maybe. You know, the interesting between you and me, but not for everyone else. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you, Alan, for sharing the bandwidth test. I'd be love to see if somebody else wants to play with it. And uh, that's it for this week. Next week, we'll see if I can't stay a little more on track with compilers. <laughs> oh, All well, right. I wanted to talk about IR design, but I don't know. Save it for next week because it's already late. But IR design is something very interesting, at least to me. I mean, we did talk about a bit about like the IR okay. design that I had, like sixty-four I'm, bits I'm, for I'm IR, like wrapping it know, up. Bye. -bye. <laughs>